Is that a yes? Oh, okay. We are going now. Thanks for being with us. I had some confusion on that we started. <laughs> That's all right. We're doing Galatians chapter 2 tonight. We have a larger audience with us, so we're excited about that. Um, and we're going to start off. Lee's going to say a prayer for us. I think Jason's got the first reading, right? I do. So go ahead, Lee. All right, let's all pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so uh, grateful for this night that we all can uh, study your word and, and going through this book of Galatians, that there's so much we can learn from it uh, about your word, uh, about our faith in Christ, that it is so well placed in him. Uh, be with everyone here uh, in our jobs that we have, in the, the day-to-day responsibilities we have, and help us to put the spiritual matters first, uh, knowing that, Father, that you control all things and that we need to uh, truly focus on you and make sure we are living our lives uh, according to your word. Uh, be with us uh, this hour and throughout this study. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, let's just kind of do this little quick review of where we were in chapter one. You remember the letter opens up, and he's really giving them a hard time about where they are, the churches of Galatia. He marvels that they're turning away so soon from the gospel that he delivered them to a different gospel, which was actually a perverted gospel. They were, they were being deceived by false teachers. And we know from the background of this letter that we talked about in a little introduction last week that these were Judaizing teachers who were hindering them and causing them to turn away and, and persuading them to keep certain aspects of the law of Moses. It wasn't just circumcision. That was a main part of it. They were adding that to the plan of salvation. But there were other tenets of Moses' law we'll find as we go through this letter that they were, they were warning them to keep as well. And those things will come up later on. But Paul opens up this letter and he just marvels about this. He says, look, if, if I come to you or an angel from heaven comes to you and teaches you any other gospel than what we've already talked to you, don't hear it. Let that person be accursed if that such a thing happens. And he said, I want you to know that the gospel that I preached to you, it didn't come from man, nor was I taught it from man. It came from the revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, the things that I revealed to you, they were revealed to me from the Lord himself. He says, I didn't have to be taught by man, man, I didn't go to the other apostles in Jerusalem to get my message. It came directly from the Lord. He did go to Jerusalem and he, he talked about that, but that was later on after his conversion. Chapter 2, he now is going to continue this thought somewhat and talk about further what happens now as he's going forward. Uh, chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately, privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But from those who seemed to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel uh, for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised, also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I was also eager to do. So after he has relayed the information about where the gospel came from, uh, his first trip to Jerusalem and how that turned out, how he wasn't able to stay there long, and then he was moved on away from there, he says, but later, 14 years later, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. Now, there's another view, another viewpoint that can be argued uh, from this. I'm going to give you the, view, the viewpoint that Andrew and I see to be the, the one that's more understandable in regard to the context. I'm going to explain it from that viewpoint. And then I'm going to toss it to Andrew and let Andrew talk about 
why we think this viewpoint is the way it seems to be to us. But let me explain it first of all uh, from this viewpoint. I think this viewpoint um, that I have, the, four, the 14 years going back up to Jerusalem, I see as the Acts 15 discussion concerning circumcision. He and Barnabas go up and take Titus along with them. Titus is in the mix now. Uh, Titus is going up as a case example, so to speak. We're taking Titus, and Titus is going to prove the point. They took Titus with them. And he says in verse 2, that I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. He didn't go up because he thought that this was just a good idea. I want you to think about this when you think about Acts 15. You may even want to turn over to Acts 15 and just look at these things side by side, and we can do that. But you remember that there were Judaizing teachers that came down to Antioch and were teaching that you must be circumcised to have salvation in Jesus Christ. And among Paul and Barnabas, there was a great dispute over that. There was great dissension that was, that was going on there. Well, remember what Paul's already said in chapter 1? The gospel came to me from Jesus Christ. I don't have to go anywhere and let anybody tell me I'm preaching the true gospel. I know I'm preaching the true gospel. He didn't have to go up to Jerusalem to determine if he was preaching the true gospel or not. But why did he go up? It's because God told him to go. He went by revelation. God said you need to go because this is going to be beneficial for you to take part in this. So, so that's why he went up. He went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which he preached among the Gentiles. But privately, he said, to those of reputation. We know from the context here that would be Peter, James, and John. James, the brother of the Lord, and John the apostle, and Peter the apostle. James the apostle, what's happened to him by this time? Dead. He's dead. He's been beheaded. Herod beheaded him uh, before this if we're talking about the Acts 15 situation here. So, he went up privately and spoke with them. If you go back to Acts 15, you see two public discussions go on at first. You have uh, Paul and Barnabas and Titus getting up. They're received by the church there. They tell about all the things that God did among them. Before that, the Pharisees, right? Right. So, the, the, didn't that have the story start? The Pharisees have... All that discussion in Acts 15? Well, that, first of all, there was, a, there was a first discussion before the Pharisees come in. They, they, oh, yeah, they're received, right. they're, they're received right. by the oh, church. Sorry. They're received by the I'm church. Sorry, they tell of the good things. Yeah. And then uh, the Pharisees come in, and then they tell, they, they stir up the dissension. You know, Judaizing teaching. Judaizing teachers come in, and they say, you know, you still have to be circumcised to be saved. Well, that discussion breaks up. And then they come together publicly again in verse 6. The apostles and elders come together with the multitude. This private discussion must have taken place in between the two public discussions. With, with Paul going in to Peter and John and James and having this discussion, it seems to fit better that way. Because when they come back together for the second discussion, it's done. They've already decided who's preaching what and what's true and what's not. So this discussion must have taken place privately in between there. Now, understand this. When he says that he went to them privately, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain, Paul is not going to Peter and John and getting them to tell him, you're teaching the true gospel. He already knew that, right? He's already determined that. He didn't need the, any more apostles to tell him what he was preaching was true. What he was doing there was to making sure that Peter or John or any of the other apostles weren't preaching the same things that the Judaizing teachers were preaching. Because if you've got apostles in Jerusalem that are preaching this Judaizing doctrine, what's that going to do to Paul's work? It's going to destroy. It's a full-out apostasy. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a full-out apostasy. Then It's going to destroy everything he's done. So all his work has been done in vain. So <laughs> when he determines that Peter and John are preaching the same gospel that he's preaching, then, then all that's taken care of. We can, we can get back to the business now of doing what we were doing ahead of time. Um, when he, when he takes Titus there in the midst of this discussion and, he, and, and this argument goes on, now you come back to the public discussion now, right? After everyone's decided we're all preaching the same gospel here, you come back to the public discussion where you have the, the Judaizing teachers even, even giving their thoughts. Was Titus even compelled to be circumcised? He wasn't. No, he wasn't compelled. Case example, we took Titus to Jerusalem. The Judaizing teachers had come to Antioch from Jerusalem and they're obviously saying, well, the apostles in Jerusalem are, are teaching something different. 
They were using them because Paul's going to say that when we get a little bit further into this context about what seems to have been said about them. But Titus wasn't compelled, even in the midst of, of the, uh, what seemed to be the most favored apostles there in Jerusalem. Titus wasn't even compelled to keep that kind of teaching. But look Wait, at verse 4. Jason, real quick, just with that word compelled, like verse 3 words it, you know, Titus, yet not even Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And I, 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 that, that phrase like, yet not even Titus, and I, I know you already was hitting at it, but I just wanted to say it again. Like it wasn't just Paul. Here's a Gentile that's come with him that evidently probably Paul converted. And he hears all this stuff, and he sees it as simple too. And I wonder if that's what kind of starting a theme here of, the simplicity of the message, which is something he already said. And perhaps the Galatians knew Titus, and that would have been some confirmation for them right. that looked like your representative was here, and he, he was on board too. Yeah. You know? Hey, Casey, this case study, Titus, yeah. he yeah. wasn't compelled to do any of this. But notice verse 4. Why did all of this take place? It was because of false brethren that were secretly brought in. Go back to Acts 15. Why did the whole... Discussion take place. Faction of Pharisees. Almost brethren came in bringing this Judaizing message. That's why this whole thing is taking place. They were brought in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which was in Christ Jesus. He's saying there, they came in to the churches, these Gentile churches, and when they came in, they came in by stealth. What does that mean? That means they came in and they looked like everybody else. They acted like everybody else. They come among you and... They, <laughs> They ask you how your sick mother was doing. It, there was nothing out of the ordinary until they got close enough to you to where they can start influencing you just a little bit. And they started feeding you something that was a little bit different. And it's caused all of this trouble. But Paul said, going back to them, they were, they were trying to rob us of our liberty and bring us back into bondage. But verse 5, he said, we didn't even yield to submission in even an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Who's the you there? The Galatians. That has to be the Galatians. If the truth of the gospel was going to continue with the Galatians, it had to already be among the Galatians, right? Andrew will come back to that point in just a second. Verse 6. Now this is what I was talking about. What probably was being said by the Judaizing teachers about Peter and John and James. But from those who seem to be something Whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows no personal favoritism to man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. This is truly Paul language here. Second Corinthians is full of sarcasm, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And right here we get a little hint of his sarcasm. The, the Judaizing teachers had probably come among these Christians and say, well, you know Peter and John up there in Jerusalem. They're really the true apostles. They were with Jesus all of that time. And they're really something. Well, Peter said, you know, those who uh, seem to be something, or Paul says, those who seem to be something, they didn't add anything to me. So what does he mean by that? They didn't add anything to me. They, they gave him no new information that he didn't already have. He had everything that he needed. Everything that he had preached among the Gentiles was everything they needed to know. That's an important thought for Lee's story next. Right. But on the contrary, verse 7, when they saw the gospel for the uncircumcised has been committed to me, just as he goes on to say that the gospel of the circumcised has been committed to Peter, you know what they said? Hey, we're in this together. We're preaching the same message. They gave us the right hand of fellowship. That's just like Acts 15. Go back over to Acts 15, and you see that, that letter that was written to the churches. Paul and Barnabas are our beloved, is what, is what they said. The word from Jerusalem was just that. And that seems to fit what we're talking about right here too as well, doesn't it? Um, they gave us the right hand of fellowship. Uh, verse 9. And James and Cephas and John, who seem to be pillars, uh, that's, that's what I just talked about there. Uh, verse 10. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to do. If this is Acts 15, I know the question is, why aren't those other things brought up? To abstain from idolatry, and from blood, from things strangled, and from blood. I don't know. I do know that happens a lot of times when things are brought up again. And I do know this, that that was a big part of Paul's work going forward, wasn't it? To remember the poor, 
Because what did he do? What did he have going later on? I mean, he had this ginormous ministry for the saints, the needy saints in Jerusalem going on. Maybe why that maybe that's why that's brought up here. That that's going to be something that was going on, going to be going forward, be a big part of what he's going to be doing. So we think about this comparatively to Ephesians or Romans. You know, what's Paul's message there? Is is a lot of I know these a lot of these Jews have treated you really badly, but there's still good Jewish Christians that need your help. And and from here on out, you know, even even if this is Acts twelve or Acts fifteen, from here on out the Gentiles are going to have to come in and save the Jewish Christians several times. And, you know, Paul's going to turn into, like, you know, you, you're kind of, like, you kind of owe them something because they're the one who preserved the oracles of God for you. So don't think this is, like, some kind of, think of it as fair, right. you know. And maybe this is kind of a beginning of that. It's saying, like, hey, you know, even though you see that everyone from Jerusalem who's come and traveled to you except for us has been trying to enforce these regulations on you, don't forget that there's still poor Jewish Christians that are good, wholesome people that are going to need your help. And I kind of see this as like a powerful reminder. Don't don't blanket statement all these Jews from Jerusalem. Right. They're not all this. They're not all looking for significance. A lot of them are looking for Jesus. Yeah. And remember, if, from Second Corinthians eight and nine, we learned that this ministry to the needy saints was was really what Paul intended to be a bridge to bridge the gap right. between yeah. Jew and Gentile. It was a major part of that work. And maybe that's why that's brought up here, because that was going to be the, the, the main thing that was going to be allowed them to see that, you know what, they love you too. They're doing this for you. They're sacrificing of themselves for you. And that was meant to bring uh, some major reconciliation. So that may be why that's the thing that's, that's put forward there, and not every element is mentioned. Go ahead with the... Uh, uh, just quickly, just to make a case for Acts 15... Um, if you want to go back in your mind to Acts real quick, Acts 11 and Acts 12 is the first time Paul and Barnabas travel together to Jerusalem from Antioch with support to the elders there in Jerusalem. And that's the first time Paul and Barnabas travel to Jerusalem. The only known second time that we have that Paul and Barnabas travel to Jerusalem in Acts is going to be in Acts 15. So in our mind, Acts 11 and 12, Paul and Barnabas come the first time to Jerusalem carrying support from Antioch. Then Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas are called to go on their first missionary journey. And if you remember the first missionary journey, all they do is they go into Galatia, basically, and then they turn around and they come back to Antioch. Then we get to Acts 14 and Acts 15. As soon as they come back to Antioch, after they went to Galatia and came back, they go to Antioch and they hear about the Judaizing teachers. So then they have to go down to Jerusalem and they have the Acts 15 meeting, right? And then they go back, and Barnabas and Paul separate after that. And they don't journey together as far as we know, right? So to make a case for Acts 15, you know, especially that, just to do a quick one, that verse 5 I think is, is telling for me at least. You know, he says that in this story, Titus did not yield, and he says we didn't yield either. And he, then he says, the end of verse 5, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you, Right? And in my mind, that implies that the Galatians already have the truth of the gospel and they need to continue with it. And that Paul and Titus say, hey, we didn't yield to this for a moment because guys, brethren, we were thinking about you in Galatia and what terrible restrictions and bondages we would have been putting on you if we yielded to this. Uh, New American Standard says, so the truth of the gospel can remain with you as in it was already there. Or... The Young Literal Translation, and I'm using all the ones that I consider good for accuracy. The Young Literal Translation says that it would remain with you as well. And so it's always past tense or present tense. The only way that the Galatians could have already received the gospel, and this story happens when it happens, would have to be after Acts 14. You know, I guess you could make a case that it was past Acts 15, but in my mind, I, I can't in my mind reconcile it happening before Acts 14 because according to verse 5, the Galatians were already converted. Like he wouldn't be writing a letter to the Galatians who hadn't been converted yet, if that makes sense. That, that, that seems fruitless, right? Um, now, to be fair, I've read that the Acts 12 argument comes from verse 10, which is they only desire to remember the poor. Um, but... 
In my mind, verse 5 makes a stronger case for Acts 15 than verse 10 makes a case for Acts 12. That's Andrew's opinion of it. Um, But the only reason why I think it's important is, I don't know, for me at least, I need to have the New Testament story in my mind. You know, every time I'm reading an epistle, or especially when I'm going through Acts, I'm putting it in a timeline in my head because I need a story arc. Now, is there some places that story arc is probably not what really happened? Yeah, sure. But at least for my sake of being able to remember these events and these stories, it helps me to put it in order in my mind. And that's why I like to talk about it. There's a, there's a second thing for me, too. Go ahead, yeah. And that is that when are we introduced to Judaizing teachers? Acts 15. Acts 15. We, we never hear of it until Acts 15. I don't even, we don't even read about that. that's a problem in Acts 11 and Acts 12. Right. But we're introduced in Acts 15. Here's where this problem has inserted itself, and it's a major problem. And that major problem is talked about again here at verse 4, very clearly, uh, because false brethren were secretly brought in. And that is exactly what's said in Acts 15. And I don't read anything about that. You have to that. be circumcised to be saved. Yeah, I don't read anything about that before. Starts in Acts 15, starts in Galatians 2. Right. Yeah. This makes more sense to me that way. Right. It, it, you may have some questions or some comments. We'd be glad to hear. Any thoughts? Right. 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 Anything else? You know, I was just thinking, you know, the situation with Titus that you know he wasn't compelled to be circumcised, but then years later, who was the other Gentile where there was a situation where he actually was circumcised? And it wasn't that Timothy? You know, Paul Yeah, Timothy was a Jew. But he was, you know, being circumcised not as a way to what they're doing, but as a way not to be, yeah. you know, disrupting the people. That there. wasn't being forced on Timothy. Not forced on. And yeah. Timothy was also a Jew, so it probably would actually aid him to fit in more with the Jewish community. Right. It's a, that's a good compared contrast. It also, here's something else. I'll say this and we'll move on. But if I take an earlier date on that, where does Titus come from? Yeah, that, That's hard to put in the story. I was thinking about that. Your only argument could be that he was one of the members at Antioch. And I don't know, in my mind, I, I just pick, I picture him just being this Gentile they pick up in Galatia. But I don't have a, you know, I don't have a yeah. verse for that. I... Okay. All right. Uh, we'll start in verse 11. I feel like that was a good buildup because now it's going to be the example of Peter. And what he, he's just said, that God doesn't show personal favoritism. And so starting our reading, verse 11. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, who would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing that those who were of the circumcision and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. I, I want to stop right there, and we can talk about this section. So now here, you know, Peter is there in Antioch, and I believe this is the Antioch of Syria, right? It's not Antioch of Pisidia. Yeah, it's Antioch of Syria. Syria, right. Because that's where those Judaizing teachers, they were traveling from, uh, from Acts. And so here is a situation that Peter, you know, he's with Gentiles. He's eating with them. And it talked about uh, the, the man that came in verse 12, that for before certain men came from James who would eat with the Gentiles. So he's eating with the Gentiles, and then they're going to come. And what happens here? That these Jews come with him, and he's going to kind of get away from them. And the picture in my mind is, you know, at a school cafeteria, you're eating with a certain group, and then 
some other men, women come in that, what are you doing eating with them? And so he might feel embarrassed that, you know, he doesn't want to bicker with the controversy there. And we see that Paul, he actually has to call him out and say, what are you doing? Because this situation is basically tearing down uh, the gospel. Uh, verse 13, it says, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him. So it, it's going to carry away the other people uh, as also as well as Barnabas was carried away uh, with their hypocrisy. Um, in verse 14, it says, but when I saw that they were not straightforward <clears throat> about the truth of the gospel. So I think a big issue here is that they weren't straightforward here. And why weren't they straightforward about the gospel? How come this situation isn't what the gospel was about? That would have been very confusing to the Gentiles that Peter would separate himself from eating with them when the Jews showed up. Because, mm -hmm. that, again, that was part of the old law that a Jewish could, person could never eat with a Gentile. Right. And if it, looks, if, it, if it even looks like Peter's trying to enforce that law, mm -hmm. well, now Peter's being confusing. He's, not taking, he's taking away from the simplicity that's right. in the gospel, right? Which is the old law has been abolished and it's been brought into the law of Christ. Yeah. yeah. Verse 15. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. That's a little, little bit of a sarcastic statement there used by Paul. Because he's saying that's really the picture that you're painting. Here you've been sitting and eating with these people all this time, and now these men show up, and you withdraw from them. So what you're saying to them is, you're sinners of the Gentiles. You know, he's making two points within that. But he's saying, you know, we who are Jews by nature, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even when we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, but by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. He said, but you know, you're saying one thing, but you're teaching something else. You're, say, you're saying that you have faith in Jesus Christ, but you're teaching them that you're justified by the works of the law. Which one is it, Paul? It's like Andrew said, this is a totally confusing situation. And in doing this, what you're doing is you're being a stumbling block instead of a stepping stone and helping people to where they need to get to. Yeah, I don't mean to steal your thunder. Like, yeah, I, don't think, I don't think you kind of covered it, but that's why Paul's going to address him publicly. Mm -hmm. This isn't a moment where he's going to pull Peter privately aside and be like, Peter, you shouldn't have done that because there's other people in the room that need to hear it right. so that it would be straightened out in their minds too. Because it, it, that's how he's being confusing, right? And if you're confusing other people publicly, then it'd be better if you kind of were corrected publicly and that way the confusion would go away, right? Right. Right, that's like if we we get up here, we start teaching a, a different you know Bible doctrine, you know, and everybody else starts to believe it. Yeah, we we like that. That's that, that, we like that teaching, you know. We and somebody in here needs to come up here and correct. No, actually, scriptures teach this. Remember what we taught you here, right? And oh, go ahead. You, before you go to the next section, are you about to go to the next? Section? Oh no, I was going to look at verse sixteen. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, when he said, "Knowing that a man is not justified uh, by the works of the law." but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus. So we know like the law of Moses that nobody could keep it perfectly. Uh, it could not justify us. And you know that justify, you know, being, being made holy, you know, being made righteous, that it was always pointing, you know, to something else. And understand that it almost seemed like a merit system of if I can keep the law, I'm going to be in good standing with God. But I think we know from Old Testament, God always required us to have faith. He always required the people of old to have faith, you know, in Him. And that was always going to be pointing to Jesus, to having faith in Him. And I think Paul makes that uh, clear here when he says that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of law. For the works of law, no flesh uh, shall be justified. Uh, I was just going to say, just an easy application out of this. You know, why does Peter do this horrendous thing? Like, you know, this is the same guy who converted Cornelius. He watched the miraculous events happen there. He goes and he repeats it in Acts 11 to everybody at home. And then he defends them in Acts 15 and retells the story. And yet, he does it again. Peer pressure. Peer pressure. He was peer pressured into doing it. He saw his buddies and he acted differently than he should have. So if... The great Apostle Peter, I use that with some tongue in cheek, right? If the great Apostle Peter is affected by peer pressure, how can we ever argue that we are not? 
You know, like we, how could we ever argue? Oh, they don't bother me. It doesn't bother me what they're saying or telling me to do. But it happened to Peter. And we see there also that the apostles, they had to grow too. Yeah. You know, they were in, a, they were in a, a learning process all the way on. Even though they were receiving direct revelation from Jesus Christ, they still were in a process of growing themselves. They were having to learn the very thing they were teaching. They had to learn it. So right. had James been killed at this point? The Apostle James. The Apostle James. So in verse 12, that the men that come up there before came from James. James, the brother of the Lord. James, the brother of the Lord. That we'd already talked about from chapter 1. Who seems to be live most of his life in Jerusalem, yeah. and it becomes like a thing. Like James stays in Jerusalem, and you can get help from James because that's where he's always at. And you see that Paul said up here earlier in the earlier reading that they, you know, he seemed to be James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars. You know, they they were very influential. Of course, the apostles were obviously influential <clears throat> by this time. James, the brother of the Lord, is a very influential person among mm -hmm. the local church in Jerusalem. And so, he's one of the first people. Uh, Paul met when he went down there the first time. Chapter one. Yeah. Okay. You have any questions or comments through there? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Repeat that for the internet. So what Ms. Best just said. Oh, that we're not justified, you know, by the works of the law, but it's pointing to Christ Jesus that that's who the faith is going to be in. Uh, that looks forward to, to chapter three, talks about the justification. Uh, and also in, in verse 17 that we haven't read yet, but uh, verse 16 when it said that for by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Uh, in verse 17, it says, But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Uh, certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So if while we are striving, you know, to be, you know, sanctified, justified by Christ, you know, he, he asks this, you know, rhetorical question in verse 17. So we ourselves also are found sinners. So is Christ, is he the minister of sin? Is he like the preacher of sin? We're saying no because you know what the law did, it would only point out our sin and basically our need to be justified uh, into Christ. And we see that phrase he often uses, like certainly not, or he'll say uh, almost like a, that sarcasm that he often has. And he said in verse 18, for if I build again the things that he destroyed, you know, what, what would have been those things that he destroyed? We had talked about it. Well, it's Moses' law. That's all those mm -hmm. things that were there before. That makes you think back to Ephesians 2. You know, talking about the, you know, that, that separation wall that Christ came in and tore down so that now we, Jew and Gentile could all be one. What he's saying here is if you continue doing the things that you've been doing, Peter, you're just building that wall up all over again. Now there's that separation there, which shouldn't be there in the first place. Uh, one more thing, if you go back to 17, this kind of pulls the illustration you were using earlier. Let's just say that uh, a group of people are with another group is, that are drinking alcohol. And let's say you're, you're part of that group that's drinking alcohol. And some of your brethren come up and they see you a part of that group drinking alcohol. And what do you do? <laughs> you back away and you're like, so what are you saying about that group? You should have never been there. You should have never been there doing that. He's saying, Peter, that's what you're saying about Christ and the Christians. If you've been spending your time eating with these Gentiles and acting like everything's just fine and okay, but when other people show up, you retreat and run away, what are you saying about your conduct? It's sinful. 
So if you're saying what Christ is sanctified is sinful, what does that say about Christ? Like you said, he's the minister of sin. That's why verse 13, the hypocrisy right. of he was being a hypocrite. Right. So it, it's basically sin by uh, sin by association. association. Mm -hmm. Couldn't get the word out. Yeah. And Christ is sitting over there with the Gentiles. And, yeah, he's sitting know. with the Gentiles. And so that, you know, it makes him a transgressor. Uh, verse 19 says, For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. So he died, you know, to that law of Moses that of all those commandments, he actually had to put that aside in, for those things. It says that I might live to God. And this is where he, I believe he's talking about salvation. Like when he came into salvation with Jesus, it says, For I have crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but now Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And this is very similar, we know, to Romans chapter 6, where there was the idea of baptism, and that when we die to Jesus, when we die to the sin, it's just like what Jesus did when He went into the grave and came back up, that we ourselves are to crucify ourselves, just as Paul is saying here. Carry your cross, deny yourself, and follow yeah. me. Yeah. And it has the idea of a change. When it says that Christ lives in me, what he is saying that what Jesus taught, that's what's living in him. You know, what Jesus taught about love, uh, about forgiving others, about you know loving your enemy, all those teachings, if we apply those things, if Paul changes to what Jesus taught, those things are living in him. If he's living that out. And he does all of this because of what? It says, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And so that's why He's doing these things here. Tell me anything on Sacrificial life, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, he's, just, he's, re he's reminding Peter and reminding all of us that you know what? It, it takes some sacrifice to be a Christian. You've got to give up some things. You know, remember Jesus? Jesus gave up a lot, didn't He? To come to this earth, to live as a man, and ultimately go to the cross and give everything so that we could have salvation through Him. And when we do that, when we crucify ourselves with Christ, as Lee was talking to, when, when we're buried with Him in baptism, we surrender ourselves totally to His will, then what's that going to call for, for us to do? We're going to have to give up some things. We're going to have to sacrifice some things. But why wouldn't we, when we remind ourselves of what has already been done for us, why do I continue to sacrifice myself and give up these things of the flesh that are, would hold me back? It's because Christ did what He did for me. And I live by faith in Him because He first loved me and gave His life for me. It's just a motivational idea. And if you forget about that, you'll, you'll forget about who you need to be. Especially like verse 19, that I might live to God. The, the way I read this sometimes is kind of this thought that, you know, if we went back to the old law, what would I have? Death. I'd have death. I wouldn't have justification. And you're about to get to that in verse 21. There's no mm -hmm. righteousness found in it. And so he's like, Peter, I left the old law, and I went to Christ with faith because that's actually where God is. And that's where I can receive justification. I can receive forgiveness of sins. And he's going to say, I can receive grace, right? I can't get that the other way around. Paul's the perfect person to tell this to Peter. Because Paul, under the old law, actually had something to lose. You know, he was on his way probably to be one of the ruling class members of the Sanhedrin. You know, he had been given jobs directly from the high priest. He was on his way to the top. And then when he is converted in Damascus, all that goes away, and he chooses the grace of God with Christ to be worth more than all the, the material things he's going to lose by not being a true Jew anymore. I'm using that phrase, like, you know what I'm saying? Now, Peter, it, Paul's the perfect person to tell that to Peter because what would Peter gain by going back to the old law? You know what I mean? Like, if, if Peter, under the old law, what did he have? Well, he was a Jewish fisherman. All of his significance in this life, and I know we usually that, use that word in a bad way, uh, anything glorious about his life, how about that, all came after the church began. That's when he became an apostle. That's when he was given to the keys of the kingdom. That's when he started, you know, receiving revelation. So everything good that ever happened to Peter happened when he entered the church. So why in the world would Peter want to go back? Paul has an argument of why he could want to go back. 
Right. But Peter really has no argument to go back. Now, to take it one step further, yeah. what about the Galatians? And I wondered if that's kind of the point here. What does the Galatians have to gain by going back, which they actually never really, to the old law? What were they under the old law? They were sinners. And they were like people, like the Jews treated them like animals. And he's saying, why in the world do you want to go back to be treated as like a second class human? Right. That's what the old law offers. But the faith in Christ offers so much more. Uh, you know, you're part of God's kingdom. You know, you're part of forgiveness of sins. There is no good reason to go back. And there was a good reason maybe for Paul, but he shows that it wasn't a good reason. There was less of a good reason for Peter to go back, and there's never been a good reason for the Galatians to go back. And that's why I kind of think maybe what the, what the application would be to that original audience, I guess. I've got an idea as to why Peter thought the way he thought, especially if this was the, the Acts 15 arrangement. Mm -hmm. just, just think about why Peter did what he did in the first place. We said it was peer pressure. Peer pressure is a big deal, isn't it? It's a big deal to everyone. But think how heavy the Jewish custom hung over the Jewish people. Back to Act, Go to Acts 21, when Paul gets to Jerusalem, how heavy is that Jewish custom still hanging over the people? When James comes to him and says, hey, here's what we need you to do. We need you to enter into this vow with these men. Because you know what? A lot of these people here, they think you don't like the law. Yeah. Right. So you see that that custom still hung heavy over the people. And that's probably why Peter did what he did because he being a Jew understood that now these men, though they were sent from James and though this discussion had already taken place and it had already been decided, look, we're not buying anything else on them. Custom hangs heavy. And we all understand that, don't we? Because it hangs heavy over us too, our customs of our day. And it certainly did with them also. So I think that gives us a little bit of understanding as to why. Not that it was right, but probably a, maybe a reason why all this took place. It wasn't just a random event. You know, because it's still going on later when Paul gets to Jerusalem later on. I'm sorry, Lee. We took no, a long time. No, hey, that's great. Great. Um, in verse 21, you know, he's made a bunch of I statements that you know I've been crucified with Christ. I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God. And he says, I do not set aside the grace of God. So let's not forget this about the grace of God. That for if righteousness comes through the law, you know, that's through the law of Moses. If righteousness comes through that, then Christ died in vain. So if we think about the whole purpose of that new covenant to come through, you know, if we could be righteous underneath that old law, then what was the point of Jesus' death? Did it even do anything? But we see that it always pointed to something else. Me and Krista were talking about, you know, does uh, the sacrifices in the Old Testament, does that forgive sin? Well, we know that Hebrews tells us that the continual offering of those, uh, of the blood, it never could forgive sin, but always pointed to, to delay God's wrath. And His wrath was ultimately justified when Christ died on the cross. So we know that righteousness could not come through the works of the law, such as circumcision, making yourself a Jew, and then now starting to follow Jesus as the teaching that they were bringing. But the only way you can become righteous is putting your faith into Jesus. And he, he makes that point uh, clear here for us to become righteous. That's what I got. That's true. Peter was presenting Jesus as useless. Right? I mean, that's right. true. That's a terrible Just thing. Just by his actions. Just by his actions. How sad of a case it would be for anyone to do that. And we could be guilty of doing that too if not careful. We always have to be careful about how our conduct, let me put it this way, what our conduct may be teaching someone else. Yes, Dave. Paul said that we did not yield to you. 
Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Just to repeat that, the the thought David brings up is when we see Barnabas at the beginning on the way to Jerusalem with the mission, is that, that he doesn't yield to the false brethren trying to force circumcision. But when he's back home and he's got his guard down and he's not on a mission, he is too gets swept away by Peter's influence. And and I think I'd be very sympathetic to that. Oh, yeah. You know, when I'm not on a mission and I'm just not thinking. That's going to be the moments that I'm going to be a, a bad example to other people. How easy is it for you to be a good Christian when you're surrounded by your people? You follow what I'm saying? I'm not just saying Christians in general. I'm saying you're Christians. Now, I, I, I'm not trying to show any partiality or speak any partiality, but we all have our people that we're comfortable with, don't we? And it's easy for us at times to be good Christians more around those people but sometimes we get around other people and like David said we tend to let our guard down and our conduct may not be what it should be yes Dave that's right good point It goes both ways. It can go both ways, no doubt. Maria points out that it, at times it can be just as easy to fail when you're around your Christian friends, your, your people that you're around, you're relaxed. because you're so comfortable and so relaxed. And you can be a bad example to them because you do kind of just relax and let your guard down. And that can be the case also. Or on the other hand, as we talked about, you can uh, be more aware when you're around your Christian friends and you put up more of a guard and maybe even you put up a facade that isn't even true. And you're, you're on your best behavior, but maybe not sincere in doing it. And that can be trouble too, can it? That can get you in just as much trouble because we definitely don't need just to wear a facade that's not sincere at all. So we have to find the proper balance, don't we? Uh, and let that sincerity ring true. Good thoughts. Anyone else? Yes, Mr. Bill. Everywhere. That's true. Any hole he can infiltrate, he'll find it. Right. I was just going to say a really kind of a shallow thought, like right on the surface of this text, but I, I think it's like one of the most powerful. Um, I know right now there's not any social events or anything like that, but they'll, they'll come back. And, and Christians evidently since the beginning tend to like to get together and eat together. You know, like there's always going to be some some individual that puts on some social event and they invite a whole bunch of Christians over and they're going to eat together. And they were doing that in the first century and we still do it today, right? And those things will come back, I think, soon. It's important who you decide to sit by. You know, that, that that's a powerful moment. When you decide to sit by somebody at that thing and you decide who not to sit by, you can be an extreme encouragement or a discouragement right there. You know, and I think about brand new converts that went to a potluck. And I specifically watched who went and sat by that person. Even though they didn't know them. Just like Peter, I don't think knew these people. He just knew that they were Christians. You know, and how much it meant for the people who did have the courage that, hey, I don't know this person, but I know they're a brand new convert. And I'm going to go sit and eat with them and talk to them. 
You know, and that I think that those are your leaders right there to do the things like that. Right. And Peter, at the beginning, he did do that. And I think probably after Paul fussed at him, he probably got up and went and sat back with that group. Yeah, that's right. But that's that's a powerful influence that we have. Just decide who we're going to sit with at some event. That can mean that can mean the world to somebody. That's all I got. Any other comments? Mm. Yes. Yep. Yeah, Miss Beth, I think about that too. I think about, you know, if I'm trying to be righteous, if I'm trying to come to church, I'm going to give, I'm going to study the Bible, and if I forget why I'm saved, that it was through God's grace, I may put to death Christ that it's because of my righteousness now that I'm doing all these good things that that's why I'm going to get to go to heaven. But as Paul said, no, I don't set aside the grace of God. That if I did, if I did that, then Christ died in vain. And you're right. Like when we explain the scriptures, you need to make a conclusion. You need to show the evidence, and you need to conclude what it is. Maybe sometimes we just think the person's going to figure it out. But even Paul doesn't do that to Peter. He he concludes his thought. That that's a good teaching tool. And Peter wants him to know it, because I think Peter probably thought this in his own mind. Well, well, what I'm going to do is not going to affect anybody else. If 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 I just step away when these men come down, it's not. I'm not going to hurt anybody else. What does Paul say? Your conduct is affecting everyone else. It's teaching a lesson to everyone else. So we cannot say, we cannot ever say that my actions don't affect you or anyone else because my actions directly affect you and they directly affect everyone else that's involved in this system of faith that we're all a part of. Isn't that true? And that makes us very important people, doesn't it? We're all very important people. Every Christian is a very important person. And my actions certainly speak much, much louder than my words. And I think that's something for all of us to remember. That's all I've got. Anyone else? Yes, Nathan. Yeah, they cling on to the only one who won't stumble. Yeah, that's right. Nathan's point was, just to reiterate that, is that even these pillars of faith, and we have pillars of faith that we look at too, but even the pillars sometimes stumble and fall. And if we put our faith only in the pillars, what will happen when they fall? We're going to fall with them. And like Andrew just said, we have to put our faith in the one who will never stumble and fall, and that's Christ Jesus. And what Nathan's point is, if we're grounded in that type of faith, we'll always be able to overcome and stand firm. And that is, that's a great point also. All right. Well, I enjoyed it. Thank you for being with us. Good study. Thank you all for being here. Lord willing, we'll uh, do Galatians 3 next Tuesday. Yep. All right. Thank you all. We appreciate it.